Simon. Hello. Very good to be here, Scott. Thank you. For <laughs> thank you for joining me. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Family well? Yes. All good. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I appreciate um, you coming on and, and, and agreeing to be part of it. It's a, it's a series of conversations I'm having with people who I'm inspired by and have been inspired by over the past 10 years of um, teachings at Still Point Yoga London, which is my, my studio in London Bridge in UK. And your name over the past five years has been synonymous with people who I've met um, through these conversations and also through teaching. So, uh, and, I, and I've had, we've had some, well, we've had f uh, students who, who we share. So it was like, a, it was just inevitable <laughs> that I would ever get you on and, and, and talk to you because I think, um, yeah, you, 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 for me and looking at you, you're one of those people who've really, really over the past, um, I think it's like a 40, 40 years now, maybe. And we'll discuss that, but who've really been defining the way that yoga can be practiced. So I thought we'd have a really great conversation around that. Uh, so I appreciate you, you being on the podcast. So the way we start with this is, and what really fascinates with me, I want to start at the beginning. And the beginning for me starts with this question of, I'd like to know when the first time yoga really impacted you. And it, would, it doesn't have to be that first time when I was the first time I started yoga. It's when you yourself felt something in you shift by doing something called yoga right it's i have like three beginnings or three or four and the first one was when i was about six years old and my father who was a, a free diver um, taught me how to hold my breath underwater for swimming primarily because i couldn't swim a lap of a pool and pass my you know swimming test which was in the UK, actually, I was trying to pass the 50 meter certificate and I just couldn't swim. I kept sinking. My bones were too heavy. So he said, um, if you're going to sink, I'll teach you how to swim underwater. And so he taught me the very basics of some pranayama, which had been passed along to him to prepare myself to swim and hold my breath underwater and what I need to do and where I have to relax and how to hold the breath. And that was an interesting beginning. And then just two years after that, I was shown what essentially is Uddiyana Bandha, Nauli and Lauliki, the, um, the Kriyas, by a, a Rhodesian at the time athlete called Basil Brown. And he showed me these on a six-week boat ride from Southampton to um, Australia when I was eight years old. And of course, you have to do them with breath retentions. So because I was so used to doing breath retentions, I was the only one of the kids around who could do it. And I kept practicing it all my teenage years. At the time, I didn't know that this was anything to do with yoga. And I was only actually getting to the point of understanding what yoga was around my mid-teens, around, say, 15 years old, when um, I had uh, a universe, a high school biology textbook, and I was um, reading about the sympathetic nervous system and the uh, parasympathetic nervous system, and it was talking about how the so the, the autonomic nervous system being, you know, this unconscious part of your body and the somatic nervous system as being the conscious part of your mind, rather. And it said that the somatic nervous system can be controlled by your conscious mind, but the autonomic nervous system, automatic nervous system, uh, can, uh, cannot be controlled by the conscious mind. Then in brackets, it said, except by some Indian yogis. And I went, so who are these strange people who can control their unconscious? You know, this, and it, it triggered something in me. Then later on, around the same time, and I'm not sure if it was before or after this, I saw a picture of this man, could be a Tibetan, Chinese, Indian monk, sitting on what looked like Mount Everest, pretty much naked in the snow. And someone said, he is a guy who's meditating. He's doing yoga. So this word meditation and yoga became synonymous for me. And around that time, I'd been doing this uh, activity in the Australian bush where I, I wanted, I explored bushwalking, but I realized that I was destroying a lot of the bush by, we called it bush bashing. 
you know, when the, when the bush is really thick, you know, like you see in the tropical jungles, they just go with a machete and hack it. Mm -hmm. Well, it was almost the same in Australia, but it just felt destructive to do this to the bush. So the Aboriginal Australians would be all naked walking through the bush. So I thought that was a good idea. So I was quite nude in my life. I've always been a nudist all my life, actually. So I took off all my clothes and would walk naked through the bush in a way where I did not touch the trees. And I didn't step on anything, didn't touch anything. And I would be weaving in and out of the forest in a way which was very resembling the animal-like movements that are so popular today. And it became my first sort of rudimentary yoga postures. And it became a meditation of sorts. And then around that time, maybe I must have been 17, I got approached by a Tibetan Lama. And he first then showed me what was Tibetan yoga. And I realized the connection between what I'd been doing with the Kriyas and the breath retention and the funny positions I was getting myself into. And that's when I started going to some classes. And I went to a few classes for a couple of years, stayed with my Tibetan Lama for about a year. And then I took a break from it because it, I just didn't quite see the connection between what I understood was yoga, being the meditation of a Tibetan monk who could sit naked in the snow, which I thought was pretty frigging amazing, and what people were doing in these yoga classes. I saw people sitting in these yoga classes in what is like a simple twist. And I tried it and I'm going, so what? What's this doing to me? I'm just twisted. It didn't feel like anything. There was no intensity. And I thought, well, why am I here? So I dropped the yoga thinking I was mistaken about its notoriety or the importance of it. And I didn't pick it up again until my uh, maybe 21, 22, after, after I did about three or four years of intense aerobics and uh, weight training. And I was really enjoying this because it you know, got me to feel something in my body and get me a bit fit. And uh, then I got quite injured doing my sports activities. I got shin sprints from running around this circuit training room. I managed to do my one gymnastics class and I tried to do my first backflip and landed on my head and broke my neck, which wasn't very good. It was a crush fracture of my C5. Wow. I tried a sword fighting lesson and I managed to get stabbed in the arm. It wasn't very clever. And then I tried a uh, Taekwondo class and I dislocated my buttocks, I think. I don't know if I think you can do that, but it certainly hurt. So I eventually realized I can't do these sports. And someone said, you just need to stretch out, mate. You know? So I got sent to a stretch class and the stretch class was run by an aerobics instructor. And one, she was good. I was enjoying the stretching because it helped my knees get better and my neck get better. And one day she couldn't uh, come to the class. So the gym that she belonged to decided they had to replace her and they replaced her with an Iyengar yoga teacher. And suddenly this woman shows up, starts showing me the same stretches I'd been doing before but they were so much more effective. You know, she told me where to press and where to push and where to turn and where to tighten. Go, oh, this is really working now. And then I, you know, took her on for about another year or so intensively. And then my girlfriend at the time said that she was about to start a teacher training course, which was when I was like 23 years old. And it turned out to be five mornings a week, three hours every morning with this Japanese Oki yoga crew. And they were pretty fun to be with. And I stayed with them for about a year and a half, two years. And we did two mornings a week straight Iyengar yoga, two mornings a week um, what was called Oki yoga, which was a combination of Bhutto, Japanese martial arts, Shiatsu, and uh, stuff like this. And one day a week of this special Japanese games and things. It was really, really fun. And I became an Oki yoga teacher in this like early 1980s then when I was about 23. So that's like, so that's going from like six <laughs> all the way through the 23, <laughs> like from, yeah. from, so if we rewind a little bit, I mean, yeah. it sounds like you had like, and we, we took a couple of you don't mind me picking that apart a little bit. It sounds like you yeah, had a please. really in, incredible childhood, especially if your dad's teaching you like, like breathing techniques to stay under the water and stuff like that, you know, uh, from an early age. And then I'm interested to when you were on and then in being influenced by someone who's showing you now, Lee, and it influencing you so much that you carried on doing it. So there's something I really find interesting about, um, one, the, the way that your parents like brought you up and then two, this, this, this one guy showing you now, Lee, and then it having such an effect on you, even though you didn't know what it, I mean, why, would he, why was this guy showing you now, Lee, on this boat? He was an Olympic athlete from Rhodesia. And yeah. he was just immigrating from, uh, from England to, well, he, we picked him up in, in South Africa, actually. 
Yeah. And so from in that four or five week period from South Africa to Sydney, he showed, I, I met his kids and we had lots of fun together. And it was a trick that he knew because as an athlete, he'd been taught some Indian yoga by his, by the Indians living in South Africa. So he so just he, showed you it because he was showing you it and you were like, oh, let's try yeah. this. And, and, and there's something what I like, this is something I like about this, that he was there and he showed you, but you had already been doing something with your father. So it's almost like you'd been, you were, you were being prepared, prepared, yes, prepared yes, yeah. which I, which I really liked. And so, and so I like this idea that you were doing something, you didn't know it benefited you, but you were just doing it and it carried on. I carried on doing it because it felt so good. And I would do it almost every day as I recall. But when he first showed it to me, Scott, I was only eight years old. And as we briefly mentioned before, how much do you remember when you're eight? You know, I vaguely remember it, but we're not really conscious. And of course, when my children were very young, I could teach them Maori when they were like six years old. And even Uriana, I think I taught my daughter Uriana when she was about three or four. You just show it to a child and they copy you. Mm. Teaching children is just show and do, you know. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same with my when my children. Noah, he just I can he can just do it like that. Right? Yes, yes, and that's yeah. it. But there's there's this lovely way about like it seems that and I'm doing my research on you that you had this kind of this environment. It seems that your parents offered you that you could. I think I I read somewhere that you that your that your mother taught you the was it the yamas or she taught she taught you yeah. the yeah. the ethical ways. Yes, yes, she's she's amazing. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. taught me all these ethical principles. My dad too. He, my my father was a um, an English army captain. He was about to be major, but he was too young to be major when he decided to bring his family to Australia, and he left. But but he had all these principles, which really are yama and niyama like principles of of the ethics of honor and you know righteousness and being chivalrous and stuff like this. And he gave yeah. a lot of that. To me. So when you when you met in 1977, the, the, your Tibetan Lama, and they showed you tantric yoga, did it feel like there was like something just that made yeah. sense? Yes, yes, because all of it was holding your breath. So the first time I was shown yoga postures, and there was a timing issue, like how long should I stay in the pose? I was told, you stay in the pose for as long as you can hold your breath. Wow. That's what I was told. This was way before people had met before Patabi Joyce had come to the um, to the West in a way that, I mean, that people started knowing about this Ujjayi breathing and this intense sort of hyperventilation most people do. To me, yoga was about breathe less, and it still is, not about breathe more. I had a brief foray into breathe more in the late 80s, early 90s, and it stuffed up my whole system. It's, you know, to try and hyperventilate the way most people are doing it. Sure. It's just a basic misunderstanding. And maybe we can talk more about that later, about how it affected the modern world of Ashtanga yoga. But it's a big misunderstanding, I think. So there's this, I mean, there's, so I love this idea that there are almost things like, well, you met your ten, these things kind of kicked on and like opened up for you almost. And then when, and then when, if I go back over what you said, after you, finished you left the tibetan lama you was you seem to be kind of shift, shift, shifting around and looking for something else like champing up with aerobics and stuff like that and and maybe gymnastics and and then yeah. then finding this next this next path in i think it's this 1980 here where you met the ioi um the your ienga teacher and that yeah, and no. that being that being where you kind of again you got it again and you felt it Yes, exactly. Because I was a little bit disillusioned for a while because the Tibetan Lama showed me stuff which totally resonated with what my father and Basil Brown had shown me with the Kriyas and the Pranayama. But, um, but then this Tibetan Lama, his name was Tuffy, he, 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 um, he appeared out of nowhere. He walked into a room when I was with other people and just grabbed me, gave me a card, said, come to my house. Like he walked in just to see me and left again. And I saw him, you know, weekly for about a year. And then he disappeared out of my life. And so I think I felt it was important I try and find something to continue with what he showed me. And so I tried the modern yoga classes at the time, which were this such an under yoga, I think it was the only one I could find at the time. And it was really lame. It was like, nah, I must have been mistaken. What this guy, this is not what this guy showed me. This is something else. This is bullshit. This is crap really like really lame missing something it was just simple basic postures and they said you're meditating and i'm going meditating this is not meditation meditation is being able to sit naked on a, on a snowy mountain 
and still look calm and peaceful without making your heart race. And I got really disillusioned thinking, why is everyone suddenly telling me in the early 80s that they're meditating? I'm going, meditation is really hard. Meditations like samadhi, meditations, the intense culmination of decades of yoga or past lives or something like this. And then, you know, suddenly in the 1980s, everyone's meditating. I'm going, how the fuck are they doing this? It's too difficult. And, and that was something you were, you were seeing already then? Yes, in the early 1980s, suddenly people started meditating. But in the 70s, I was under the impression that meditation is something which not just anyone does. It's something which a really adept, superhuman uh, yogi from either Tibet to China or India or something like this, who can actually control their unconscious, be able right. to circulate blood in any part of their body and be naked in the snow, right. and yet be completely peaceful without sort of any stress inside their body, yet have incredible circulation. So right from the off, then, you were looking for someone who could show you these principles. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the Tibetan Lama was good. You know, he showed me a, a bunch of stuff. It's very hard for me to remember exactly what he showed me because it was almost like every week I was with him, I was in a trance. It was like he was doing this subliminal mind <laughs> trip with me. I don't know what it was. It was, in, it was intense. And so you kind of, so that's when, when you, 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 when you left him and then you were, playing around with it and you think you probably you're thinking well what is this and then you jump into the Iyengar the Iyengar teacher yes. and it resonates and you feel it and someone shows you and gets and, and and how did that how did that sit that when when you found that okay so when I found this Iyengar teacher around the same it sort of triggered my interest in yoga suddenly that's when I started the first triggering was this Iyengar teacher to go from a stretch class which I was just doing the stretch class because I had knee injuries and the, and the aerobics instructor said, come to my stretch class, I'll fix your knees and you can run again. And I was doing the stretching because it was helping my knee, but I didn't really do it because I thought it was of any importance other than to fix the knee. But then when the stretch class teacher couldn't come and the Iyengar teacher took their place, then I felt, oh, there's a lot more to these stretches that I didn't realize. But then right around that time, I had the girlfriend who invited me to come to a teacher training with her. I did that. Then I started teaching. And in about 1984, I met a really amazing guy called Professor Bim Dev Malik. I think that's how he says his full name. I knew him as Professor Bim. And you can maybe see one video on him on, on the YouTube where he's an incredible yogi. He can do things like uh, bend steel bars with his throat or with his eyeball, you know, like put an actual one centimeter thick metal bar which is maybe two meters long and you'll put one mm. end on his throat, the other end against the wall and bend it with his throat with pranayama wow. or put it against his eyeball and bend it with his eyeball by breathing into his eyeball. And then you'd lie on a bed of nails. You know, I'd actually help him on stage after a while because I got to know him quite well and he taught me pranayama and stuff. And, um, and so he, I went, went on stage with him and we'd put, uh, him on a bed of nails, put a concrete block on his bed of nails and smash the concrete block open. And he was quite phenomenal. And I still am in contact with him now. He's in his late seventies now. And he was an all India gold medalist in yoga, you know, at, at the, in the 1971, right. 72. Quite a remarkable guy. He could stop his heartbeat. And so this, I thought that this is real yoga, like the Tibetan, like the Tibetan Lama guy, you know. But then around that time, I met Shandor. And possibly, I'm not sure exactly, I might have met Shandor first because Shandor was an Iyengar yoga teacher and Shandor taught excellent Iyengar yoga. And uh, I, I was with Shandor from about 1985, I think I met him, to about 1993 to 97, a little bit more. And I'm still in touch with him. I still see him, bless him. He's a wonderful man, incredible guy. But um, at the time, he was very much into Iyengar as his teacher. So he taught me a lot of Iyengar yoga. He probably taught me more Iyengar yoga than Iyengar did. Although the only person to teach Iyengar yoga is Iyengar, really. And right. one of my students just contacted me today saying that, you know, she also studied with Iyengar and said that there's only one person who really taught Iyengar yoga, and that was him. And I totally agree. Most of the Iyengar yoga in the world today is not what I'd consider Iyengar yoga. It was people missing the point often. There are what, exceptions, of course. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Look, Iyengar yoga often in the modern world today is associated with very serious yoga, alignment-orientated yoga, very detailed yoga, and very much strict and, you know, 
you're not allowed to compliment people, you're not allowed to, all this stuff to me, which didn't make sense. Iyengar was, you know, for a start, he was very, very fun to be around. He was strict and heavy, he hit me a few times, but every time he hit me, I knew he was hitting me in a place, which taught me something. You know, like, you know, this is the part of your back that you have to move in, whack, and he hit me on that part of the back. Oh, yeah, I feel that, yeah, I feel that. Or, for example, if, if you did something right, he would compliment you, you know. Uh, and if you um, were doing stuff with him, he'd be having a good time. He was like a child. He was like a really sort of enjoying life, childlike person who had a really good time. He had a bit of an ego sometimes, but he was talented. I saw him take a Vietnam vet who had uh, been shot in Vietnam 15 years earlier and make this guy's arm move. The arm was paralyzed. And he made this guy's arm move again for the first time in 15 years. Yeah. I saw him do amazing things. I think he's an incredible man, Iyengar, and I have a lot of respect for him. But, you know, one, I went for an Iyengar Association assessment. I, I think I passed my introductory and my intermediate, and I was going for the next level up. And they didn't pass me because they said that I moved around too much, that I complimented my students, that I was um, uh, using the wrong language, and the language I was using was the language of a physiotherapist, mm -hmm. but they wanted me to use the Iyengar speak, you know, the right. um, pull the chip of the flesh, make the, the suck the flesh to the bone, pull the inner chip of the knee to the flesh and circularize your ribs and all this to me, which words, which didn't make sense, which were words, which were spoken by someone who had English, not as his first language. And it was taught as jargon language, which you had to, to fully explain to a student before you before they understood, understood what, it, what it meant. Even right. things like pull up the kneecaps, which are so commonly spoken about now, was something that he made. I think he invented the term, pull up your kneecap. And it's something you can't just say that to a beginner student without explaining what they mean. Stretch right. the mat with your feet. You know, stuff like this did not make sense to the average person unless he actually showed you and said, what I mean by this expression is this. And you'd probably sit for one hour with him while he explained an expression. Then after that, he'd use the jargon. But Iyengar teachers all around the world and many other teachers as well will take this jargon language, sentences, expressions, which each of which require an hour to explain, and they will just use them in a class. And most people just go, this is gobbledygook. This doesn't make sense. Mm. And they just don't get it. So Iyengar wow. was really great. Shandor taught me more of the methodology, I think, than Iyengar did. And he taught me from 85 to, like I said, I still see him now, but I probably stopped being his regular student about 1993. In 1997, he sold me, me and my business partner, Bianca Matchless. He sold us our second school in, um, in Bondi Junction in Australia, in the Bondi Beach. We had another school for 10 years before that or 15 years before that but he gave us his school and said you run it as well and we took on some of his teachers as well and then you know he kept seeing us yearly usually to come for a workshop and i've you know i talked to him on his birthday every year and and uh bring him up and i haven't seen him for about a year and a half since i've had lunch with him but i i totally respect him and admire him and for me he's one of those people that no matter how smart I get and how much I think I know, I know he's 12 years ahead of me and mm. whatever I learn now, he's already 12 years further in front of me from what he knew before, you know, we'll keep on learning. And you know, he didn't start teaching or showing shadow yoga till after him and I left. So I don't know much about shadow yoga, but beyond what I see and what he showed me in the beginning, but um, I have every respect for him. And he was the one who sent me to Iyengar. Right. So in 1985, he said, you should go see Iyengar. He was going to come with me, but at the last minute, he couldn't come. So we, I went by myself in the end of December 1985. And I spent a month with him then. And then I went again in October 86. And then again in 88. Again in 91, 93, 95, and 97. I spent uh, a month or two each time with Iyengar then. And... Um, one time, even Shandu did come with me. We went to Rishikesh with Mr. Iyengar in 93. I think that was pretty amazing. So you really spent some good time with, with Iyengar then? Yes, like. although, you know, by that stage also, he was getting a bit older, so he wasn't teaching every class. So I also owe a lot to 
his son Prashant and his daughter Geeta, who taught a lot of the classes as well, and they were very amazing people. Prashant's still alive. Uh, Geeta sadly left us last year, the year mm. before, I think. Mm. But um, but they were pretty amazing people, and they all had their way. Um, you know, Prashant, his son, was amazing when I met him. He he could do incredible tricks. Very sadly. Around the late 80s, he had a major car accident and lost the use of his arm, one arm, and that restricted his practice. And I think it affected his you know, view of life as well. And he was a little bit more, less the jovial young man and a little bit more the serious person who's had a major injury after that point. You know? mm. And his daughter also was quite sick in many ways. So she had to work with those restrictions. Whereas the father was, was very different. Amazing guy. And while you were while you were in India, did you study? Did you study Hindu a lot, or did you just study with Iyengar, or was there other other teachers you oh, worked yes. with while you were Actually, there? Yeah, it's funny because around the same time as I met Shandor, Shandor also had been doing Ashtanga Yoga as well at the time. He he was familiar with that whole system, so he introduced me to a guy called Robert Lucas. And we all worked in the same place. And Robert Lucas was one of the most phenomenal Ashtanga practitioners. He probably still is. I haven't seen him for a while. Um, but he taught me first series Ashtanga Yoga in about 1985. And it wasn't too difficult for me to learn. I was like 25 years old. I'd been doing quite a bit. And like Mr. Iyengar said in his book, Light on Yoga, if you sincerely practice the, the poses in the sequences he's given, it should take the average person, presumably, of healthy you know, uh, body type, and I was in my early 20s, so it was fine, about three years to learn all the poses. And it took me about that time. So by about 1985, I could do most of the poses in light on yoga, could do um, you know, 108 backflips in a row, which was something Shandor got me doing because wow. uh, Iyengar would do it. Every Friday, we'd do Viparita Chakrasan, 108 in a row. And I remember coming to Iyengar one time and said, Guruji, I did the 108 flips in five and a half minutes. And he goes, oh, my best time was four and a half minutes. And I went, oh, fast. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was a fun guy. He was a really fun guy. And, you know, Shandra and I used to do that on Fridays as well. But then around that time in the you know, mid 80s, I met Robert Lucas, who taught me Ashtanga Yoga primary series. And then I went to um, India in 86 and 87. At the end of 86, I met an amazing guy called Cliff Barber. Have you heard of Cliff Barber? Yeah, I've heard Cliff Barber. Yeah, Danny, I did a conversation with Danny Paradise and he spoke about Cliff Barber. Lovely. Okay, so Cliff was, um, was my teacher of second series. And while I was working with Cliff, Danny comes along onto the picture as well, Danny Paradise. And he showed me third and fourth series and I practiced it a little bit with him for a while. Not so much in a class-like scenario, but I still consider him my teacher of third and fourth series. And hey, Danny. You know, I'm, I'm in, yeah, yeah, I'm still in fairly regular contact with Danny and I love him. He's a beautiful man. Yeah, and amazing. we visited Cliff in Greece a couple of years ago. Danny and I went to visit him. And so they, they made me familiar with the Ashtanga series. And it wasn't until 1989 that I actually went to Mysore for the first time then. And, uh, and then I didn't spend too long in India with Patabi Joyce, but then he went to, he came to Australia, I think in 96, 98, 2001, 2003, and I did stuff with him there. And along the way, you know, right from 89, I started meeting Sharat when he was a young boy then. And then I actually went to one of Sharat's workshops in Bali in about 2008 or 2010. And I still teach an Ashtanga practice a couple of times a year. Usually in all my teacher training courses, I'll take people through about four or five hours of Ashtanga Yoga, where I go through each pose in detail, and then we do it flow through. Usually I'll use one of Sharat's or Guruji's tapes to take people through at the pace and in the rhythm that they do it. And I'll show people modifications of the pose. And I do actually have a, a video series, which I filmed five years ago, which has taken me five years to edit because it's like about 40 hours of video material wow. on Ashtanga Yoga primary series. And I'm about to release it very soon. It's all ready to go. Wow. Let but me know when, let me know when that, that comes. I will, we'll, we'll share that for sure. Oh, um, yeah, I'd love you to. That'd be really great actually. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, there are the other, cause this is great that you're bringing these people up because also um, I'll, 
that I read somewhere else that you worked with uh, TKV Jessica Chow as well. So, yes, yes, yeah, we might as well talk about kind of like yes, the, 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 the three kind of yes, the three spheres of Krishna yeah. Yeah, I mean? yeah, I, I, I'm sad that I miss Krishna Macharya because I was in India just at the same time he died. He died, I think, in '89. Yeah. But I was in Pune at the time studying with Iyengar. And, uh, and so I missed him. But then I met Jessica Cha, bless him, when he came to Australia. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have a few dinners with him and, and chat to him. And he was very, very nice, really approachable, lovely man. And, um, and then I did a few of his workshops and things. He was the one I studied with least of all, but right. probably the one I got closest to in terms of being able to talk to him as a person. Right. You know, he was really lovely. Very lovely. And so, but the, it sounds like the anger was the most influential out of, of, all, of all of that. Probably, and, and yes. Yeah. Actually, now that you mentioned, you, you mentioned about what else was I doing at the time. So I was about to say that by the time I got to Iyengar, I'd already been um, influenced by Ashtanga Yoga. And to me, when I did Iyengar Yoga for the first time, my thought was, like I said before, ah, this is the real yoga. What I was doing before was just those simple stretches. Then when I did Ashtanga yoga, I went, oh no, this is the real yoga. Because this felt real. And I had a wonderful Iyengar teacher at the time. And uh, you know, she taught me so much. But after a few years of me doing my own path, I said to her, would you like to practice an Ashtanga sequence with me? She said, oh yeah, why not? So we went through the primary series and she could do all the poses effortlessly. And at the end of it, I said, so what do you think of it? She said, oh, she says, it's a little bit like I've had this car for quite a few years now. And every day I go out and check the oil and check the engine pressure, tire pressure and engine and stuff like that. She said, today was the first day I felt like I went for a drive. Well, there we go. Ashtanga yoga practice. And it was such a beautiful analogy. You know, it was such a beautiful analogy. The Iyenga practice, more like checking the oil, the tire pressure, making sure the engine can rev okay. But to actually go for a drive in the Ashtanga practice, this idea of a moving meditation of actually doing rather than thinking about it. Doing yoga rather than thinking about yoga. So because so much of Iyenga yoga became a head trip. You know, we would spend in the, Ash in the Iyenga classes, Maybe in a two-hour class, you might spend an hour going back and forth to get props. Yeah. You know, it was not really meditation. It was stop, start, hint, hints at meditation. So that was my feeling when I did Ashtanga Yoga. Aha, this is the real yoga. But when I got to India and I was doing this intense sessions with Iyengar and his family, somehow I got in touch with someone, I don't know who, who put me in touch with the children who were uh, working at the Maharashtra, uh, uh, it's called Maharashtra Mandel in Tilak Road, which is the place where they taught Malakam. And Malakam is essentially meaning the wrestler's pole. But if you're a wrestler and you want to wrestle someone, you grab them by the neck and throw them over your head. But if you haven't got a person, you grab a pole and the pole is fixed into the ground and you lift your body up into the air in what essentially looks like the modern day pole dancers do. Yeah, I know the one and you so mean. I've seen, I've yeah, seen it online, yeah. Quite phenomenal. And so I was learning that when I was like 25 years old and I continued it till about, about 35 years old. And I've done a little bit since then, but not so much. And I tried a few pole dance things as well. I got my kids into it a bit, which is good. But that was something which, as soon as I got on this pole, I went, aha! This is the real yoga. Because, of course, they didn't call it yoga. They called it malakam, which is a martial art. But um, the rest, you know, it's a wrestling martial art. But they would, you know, they would grab the pole. And to get onto the pole, I mean, this is a funny story for me. Because when I got there and I started, you know, they realized that I wanted to learn with them. They were like, yeah, Australia. They'd clap. Come train with us, Australia, Australia. They'd call me just Australia. And so the, the deal was the beginning exercise was called Dasaran. And you'd have to hold the pole from behind your neck with your arms over your head. And then you'd lift up your leg off the ground in what looks like Dandasana, except you're not on the ground. You know, your body's shaped like Dandasana, like Navasana Dandasana. Sure, but you're holding yeah. yourself in the air with your core and your hip flexors and your knee extensors working to hold you in place. Then you would continue to lift yourself further up to, till the pole was over your, till the legs were over your head in what looks like a sideways version of halasan, the plow. 
Yeah. Then okay, your yeah, legs yeah. would wrap around the pole. You'd squeeze the legs together and let go of your hands. And then you'd arch up into what is like a, a locust, a shalabasan. And then yeah. from there, you'd reach back with your hands, grab the pole again, and then you're in kapotasan. Exactly. And so then as soon as you got kapotasan, you'd let go of your legs and you're back to dandasan. So you'd be this sequence of climbing up a pole, going dandasan, halasan, shalabasan, kapotasan, let go, begin again. And that was called one dasaran. And it was, even though I could do 108 backflips in a row, My that gosh. was challenging. And I got off the pole and I was like, I leant forward and crutched my groin because my whole testes had been completely crushed. <laughs> it was really difficult, really oh, difficult. And the kids started laughing and they were like, hey, Australia, but laughing their heads off because I was in such pain. And I said, why are you laughing? And they showed me their uh, leather uh, underpants, you know, these armored underpants that they forgot to give me. They thought that was really funny. But they thought that since I managed to survive the initiation of doing one dasa run, they invited me to come to their around competition, which was on the following Sunday. They said it's 6 a.m. And I went, oh, I'll come, I suppose. But 6 a.m. Sunday morning when I didn't have an Iyengar class, I wasn't that keen. But I arrived and because I was the first, because I was the Australian person, a visiting guest said, you go first, Australia. So I went to go up and do my one run, which I knew would be difficult at 6 a.m. But I pushed myself and I did it. And I was just about to get off and they go, no, Australia, more. Do another, do another. And I'm going, another one, you must be mad. That was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. But because they were all egging me on, these kids from the age of six to about 25, 30, I went, okay, I'll do another one. And I'm pushing myself and shaking and vibrating. And I'm just about to get off after I finish the second one. They go, Australia, come on, another one, another one. I go, are you mad? This is insane. This is, it's like fully just using every muscle of my body. But I pushed myself because they were so enthusiastic. And I shook and I sweated. And I literally finished it, but it fell off. And they were clapping, yay, Australia, Australia, yay, yay, because they like playing cricket with Australia. So they sure, Australia yeah, yeah, yeah. And I walked off with my head held high and my head shaking. I did it. Wow, that's pretty freaking amazing. And then the next kid got up. He was like 16 years old. He did it 265 times wow. without getting up. And I, I just shrunk into the corner feeling like a complete loser. And I, these kids would do amazing things. That was the, the only exercise I really got to learn. I do a few other simple static tricks, but they would start up like that, land on top of the pole, uh, do a handstand on top of the pole, fall off, do a double back somersault off the pole. They'd run up to the pole, do a backward somersault, catch the pole with one knee. Or they'd, uh, actually they taught me Ekahasta Mayurasana. That's where I learned Ekahasta Mayurasana from I think fourth or fifth series now they put it into Ashtanga. And that was where I learned that. But I fell off the pole while balancing on one arm and chipped my tooth, I think, at the time. But that was what I thought was, wow, this is the real yoga. But it was a martial art. And then not so long after that, maybe about three years later, I was in southern India. And then we came across Kalari Payat, which is the other martial art of South India. And then I saw them doing yoga postures but the yoga postures were with knives and daggers and spears, and they were doing full on martial arts using yoga postures. And I go, hold on, this is not the yoga that I thought I knew. And so much of the modern yoga that people were saying, I think there was that book by Mark Singleton a few years ago where he was, I think he's changed his view now a bit, but they were talking about how they thought that modern yoga was something which is derived really from the British Raj coming to the Mysore palace and teaching Krishnamacharya and that yoga in India wasn't like this before because the old Indian texts never showed all these poses. And I, I had to go, no, they were not part of modern yoga. They were part of Indian martial arts. And most of the Indian martial arts poses are the ones that you see in light on yoga. And that's what I saw both from Kalari Payat and from Malakam. And there are books going a thousand years old, according to the Indians, which show these poses. But they're not in yoga books, the martial arts books. And I believe that's why we're doing warrior poses and stuff like this, mm -hmm. you know. And also even poses like Ashtavakrasan, which you know that where you wrap the legs around the arm. That's more like something that you would do if you 
were in Blade Runner, that girl in Blade Runner who would jump up to that, I think it was Harrison Ford at the time, and she would wrap her legs around his neck, spin and throw him over. So if you throw your, your legs around someone else's legs or neck and you spin, the way you would in Ashtavakrasan with the ankles, you knock someone over. So to me, it's a martial arts movement as well. You know? So it's like you, you, like you, did you actively seek these things out or do, were you just, did you just come across them? I just came across them all. I, I think that um, somehow I got introduced to these pole yoga Malakam boys. They introduced me to a doctor or it worked the other way around. And somehow I ended up uh, in the hospital in Pune because the, the people told me that I, the people told the doctors there that I was a um, university lecturer teaching medical students. Actually, I was a university tutor, like, and I was teaching first year biology to medical students. So it was a lot less than what it sounded. And they also said that I taught yoga to young mothers and their babies, which I did do, but it made me sound a lot more official. So suddenly I found myself working on my nights off from Ayenga in the Sassoon General Hospital. And on my third night there, I was in the maternity ward. They were giving me young mothers to deliver babies out of them. And this was quite shocking at the time. I was helping on cesarean sections and stuff like this. Wow. It was full on, you know? And so somehow these doctors and the Malakam people just came to introduce themselves to me and uh, it was quite phenomenal. So it's just like you've been like really open to all of these different ways of seeing Yes. What could be could term yoga practice or these different layers that and, and yes, they, they said the teacher comes <laughs> exactly right, but and that's really amazing that you just but there's something I love you, which you kind of this thread is like oh, this is the real yoga almost like that that you're kind of like this is that thread that goes right back to when you were yes. young about going oh no it's yes. this, this this is it this is it this yes. is it yes. um, and yes. I'm wondering if that's fired with that meditation of the guy who who could be sitting naked in the snow. That's what yeah. I thought I was trying to find, how to meditate by sitting naked in the snow. Can I ask you, did, did when you went, because there's off the side of this, there's also your incredible like, um, like academic study, right? And is, is that, was that something that was influenced you moving in the academic, academia side of, you know, going into working with, uh, in biology and stuff like that? Yes, yes. Because I started doing, my first uh, degree was, mostly in biological sciences. And then I did a postgraduate degree in molecular biology, which was also very, you know, human biology orientated in many, way, many ways. And around the time of my first teacher training course, I was heavily engaged in molecular biology, genetic engineering and stuff like this. And I became a lecturer in that at one point. And then around 1992, my professor said to me, why aren't you at the molecular biology meetings on a Tuesday night? And I said, I teach my yoga class on a Tuesday night. He said, are you going to be a serious scientist? Because if you're going to be a serious scientist, you have to choose either molecular biology or yoga. You have to choose. And I went, if I have to choose, and I quit the molecular biology. And because it, they wouldn't let me, they wanted me to basically quit teaching yoga and, uh, you know, take it on much more seriously. And I said, no. It was too important for me. And, but I remember when I was doing my experiments, when I was more doing research, every experiment seemed like a yoga assignment to me. Um, every every experiment felt like, like, like a yoga asana? Yes, yes, really. somehow. And what, and what, so, what, what do you mean by that? I was somehow approaching it the same way. It seemed like, like my life was at the time living on the laboratory floor when it rained, I, I slept on the floor of my lab, or I lived in my car, or whoever's house I happened to sort of find that night, I would set up a little biffy bag, like a little uh, wet weather sleeping bag, and sleep on their front garden. So I was sleeping outside, waking up at uh, 4.35 in the morning, every morning, going to do my three hour yoga session. Then I'd go and work um, in the laboratory for most of the day. Then I'd go, back and, and teaching as well. I was teaching as well, both yoga and also my um, uh, university teaching. Then I'd have a job in the evening to work out to earn money. And I'd do my yoga practice. Usually I was working at a cinema. So I would do my, you know, 
two hour practice between the movie sessions. So altogether, I was doing about six to eight hours of yoga a day in my twenties, like a lot because you can, yeah. and I did, and I you know, wasn't interested in anything else really. But around 1992, when I quit um, the human biology situation, I was a bit lost. And I realized, actually, I thought I could get a job as a scientist. One of my friends the year before had, had been, um, he had a tractor fall on him very sadly. And he recently passed away, actually. But um, I'm sorry. he became quadriplegic, like became paraplegic. And I helped him. He asked for my help and I did my best to try and help him. And he believed that I did something to really help him. So he then contacted the ride rehabilitation center where he'd been uh, rehabilitating and invited me to come to give a lecture to the doctors there about how to rehabilitate um, paraplegics. So I came along and uh, they asked me to do a whole presentation. So I did a full presentation with PowerPoints, well, no, it wasn't PowerPoint, it was data projector, you know, like a overhead slides, you know, sure, put it on yeah, a PowerPoint, yeah, yeah. Exactly projector right. like they used to in the old days, and uh, showed all these anatomical things and showed the exercises I did to help the paraplegics. And the doctors were really impressed because by that stage, I was a lecturer myself, I could give a decent presentation and I had a scientific background, so I could talk to these people. And he was convinced that, yeah, he said, this stuff is really, he got up going, the head doctor, this stuff is really good. We've got to get you in here right away to start working with the paraplegics. And I'm thinking, yes, I've got a new job and it's a passionate thing because it's yoga, it's also science and with the medical community. And he said, let's see what our physiotherapists have to say. And these two elderly female physiotherapists stood up and said, oh no, none of this has been proved or tested. It's too unsafe. You might cause damage to the paraplegics. I'm going, how much more can you damage them? They're, you know, I, I wasn't going to hurt them. I was going to help them. But the doctor said, oh, no, we have to listen to the physiotherapist. We can't have you come. And I was totally despondent. And I realized that now I had no university job and I had uh, no possibility of doing, you know, the, the helping of these people that I could. I thought, if I'm going to help people in a way which seems substantial, apart from just teaching yoga, then I had to be able to talk to the doctors. So I toyed with the idea of becoming a doctor which I could have gone into. But the medical thing is like, I'm not sure what it's like in England now, but here it's six years study and then another yep. six years of internship. And you're doing 12 years before you get anywhere. And I was already in my 33rd or 32nd year at the time. And so I thought, no. Nah. So then someone suggested physiotherapy. You could do it in four years and the physiotherapist can talk to the doctors. So I, I took that option up. And then for me, physiotherapy was the way I could do exercise-based physiotherapy in the guise of yoga or yoga-based therapy in the guise of physiotherapy. And I still do that today. If someone has a problem and they ring me up, I say, how did you hear from me about me? Someone says, I hear you do incredible yoga. And I go, okay, fine, I'll teach you yoga. And someone says to me, I heard you're a good physiotherapist. I say, good, I'll give you good physiotherapy. Effectively, I teach them the same stuff. Mm. It's exactly the same. But what they call it is what they want to call it. And if someone, in the modern world, yoga has become almost a dirty word now. There are so many people who have so many bad things to say about yoga because, look, you know, when, when I started, you had to do a lot of yoga before you became, became a teacher. You know, the yeah. Ayanga system, we're talking seven or eight years of real apprenticeship before you become with anyone. Same with the Ashtanga system. I mean, it's, it's pretty heavy. But now with Yoga Alliance and the complete nonsense they've done is you can do a month, even mostly online, and you can become a yoga teacher, which is complete nonsense. And in the last, we used to run teach training courses in the 1990s, Bianca and myself, but we realized that, you know, you can't teach people for three years and expect them to be good teachers. And so we stopped doing it. Plus, we noticed that no one else wanted to do it anymore because they thought they could become teachers in nine months at the time, which later became two months, which by the 2000s became one month. So we stopped teaching teachers except occasional apprentices. But then eventually I said to my business partner, we must go back to running teach training courses and do what everyone else is doing, these 200 month, uh, hour intensives. Otherwise, we're losing all our students. So we, we've been running them since 2014. She was very reluctant. She said it was dishonest to teach a te to someone to be a teacher in 200 hours. And I said, look, I'll make it completely clear to people. You will get a 200 hour 
teaching certificate from Yoga Alliance will give you everything that they need you to have. But almost certainly what I'll be teaching you mostly is how to do yoga because you can't be a, 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 mm. a driving instructor until you learn how to drive. And most of these people coming to our courses did not know how to drive their cars. So very little in, in my courses do I teach on the actual teaching part. I'm teaching them how to do yoga. And I make it clear from the very start, this is a 200 hour intensity. And you're gonna hopefully learn how to do better yoga for yourself. And once you've learned to satisfactorily teach yourself, then you're ready to teach other people. Mm. So, so, so we've got this kind of like, we've got this, this 1992, which seems like a bit of a, bit of a crux year, right? where you kind yes, of, yes, you've was, got this kind of like, I'm going yes. this way. Do you ever wonder what would happen if you'd gone right now, I'm gonna go with molecular biology? <laughs> <laughs> I probably have paid off my mortgage, Scott. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Because that becomes an interesting issue. Because like I said, there is this problem now in the world of modern yoga that many people are not doing modern yoga because they've been learning what essentially is overstretching, overtensing, overbreathing, often overthinking when they should probably just be more meditative and not thinking at all when they're doing really highly dangerous things and they should think about what they're doing. Otherwise, they cause damage. And so I see a lot of problems in the world of modern yoga, highlighted by what I said about Yoga Alliance's, what I would consider fairly irresponsible way of taking people to become yoga teachers. Mm. And I, you know, maybe that's a bit harsh to say that, but really what it did was destroy the economy of the yoga teacher as well. But there's something about interesting about, like you spent, what, 15, if, well, from, from, from your Tibetan Lama to that 19, so from 1977 to 1992, you'd had 15 years of very, very, focused, strong, um, incredible teachings and practice yourself. Um, mm. And then you became a physiotherapist, right? And this is the interesting yes, yes. thing because then, because then what did, what shifted, did anything shift between being a physiotherapist and changing what you've done with the anger system and then being a physio physiotherapist and then going, actually, now I know this, this is how I'm going to move. And it seems to me that there's, there's another dance that you took. Can you talk about that? Yes. Yes, yes. It's um, interesting because I had been teaching for 10 years when I became a physiotherapist, when I, when I actually started my physiotherapy degree. And one of the reasons why I was attracted to becoming a physiotherapist was because I felt that even though yoga seemed good, the yoga that I'd learned from Iyengar and it was helping me fix up many of my musculoskeletal injuries that I'd, you know, you know, like I did a few things over the years not through yoga, but through just accidents in my life, you know, breaking my neck when I was doing my gymnastics class, dislocating my knee when going for a dance one day and skiing and having a few car accidents and stuff like this. So a lot of bits were already broken and it was fixing me in some ways, but not perfectly. And my yoga that I was teaching that I'd learned from the various teachers, including Iyengar, was helping many of my students, but not all of them. And I thought maybe I don't really understand enough. So maybe if I go back to university and learn physiotherapy, maybe because these people know about the body, I'll be able to understand a bit better. And it was a total eye opener. And I realized so many things that were not really made clear in the world of modern yoga, especially stuff about how, what the normal person's body is like and how different it is to the natural body. And then the state of how traditional yogis have a much more natural body, we'll call a traditional body, and modern people have a completely non-traditional, very normal, modern body, which is anything but natural. So if you try and give traditional postures to a normal, non-traditional body, you get problems. And that was one of the reasons why it wasn't working and why most yoga in the world today that's been taught will only work at a very few number of people. So what I often say to my uh, students is, when you first uh, test yoga on people, you get this, quite ubiquitous result all around the world. If you invite 200 people to come to their first modern yoga class, 100 will say no straight away just because of the word yoga. But of the 100 that actually arrive in the first class, 50 will never come back after the first class. Of the 50 remaining, there'll only be five left at the end of the first year. And then most of those will join a teacher training course. And then mm. most of those will not last more than five years before they have something major go wrong with them that disables their teaching. If it's not physical, it will be economical probably. But, um, but you see, most people, like if you go into an Ashtanga yoga class, for example, I remember seeing the expressions on the faces of the primary series students and observers 
who came in to see myself and about 15 others doing one of uh, Patabi Joyce's intermediate led Ashtanga practices, which was a three week amazing course. We did this three week amazing course, intermediate series with Patabi Joyce and his grandson and uh, in Australia. And the six o'clock or five o'clock class was primary series. There was 80 people in it. And then at eight o'clock, they had the intermediate series. And there's only 15 people in it. And they came from, you know, Singapore, Japan, South Africa, New Zealand to come to Australia because it was rare he ever did this sort of course. I think it was the first one he ever did, a three-week intermediate-led series. And only 15 people came. It was 1996, I think. And it was an amazing class, but everyone in intermediate series was quite capable. And so before the class started, everyone was warming up. People doing their backflips, handstands, scorpion, legs behind the head. And you heard the people who were guests and people from primary series watching the comments they're making like, oh, wow, this Ashtanga yoga makes people really strong and flexible. And you go, no, no, alternate hypothesis. This is a survival of the fittest. The weak, stiff people left ages ago. All that's left is the strong, flexible ones. Did the yoga actually make people fit and flexible? Or did the weak ones get weeded out and at the end of it were just a few who were left who were made a bit stronger, but they had something special in the first place? Like something like for me, for example, I'd been given some really clever clues when I was six and eight years old. Not, not so much physically, but physiologically, it made a big difference to my spine as well. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, many of them had been, like in the class, I remember there was a couple of professional dancers, a couple of elite martial artists, you know. And so these people are going to be able to do stuff much better than the average person. Not, it's, like, it's not to say it's wrong to do martial arts or yoga or, or gymnastics or dance and then come to yoga. It's not like it's cheating. It's like you need to have started yoga very early in life to achieve success in, um, in most poses. For most people, there are exceptions. You know, my sister, for example, she can do quite amazing things and she's, you know, in her late fifties, or maybe I shouldn't tell that to people, but she might get upset if she hears this, but you know, she's quite amazing still, but she's had a very good diet all her life and she's had a very natural lifestyle, never did extreme sports. But most people, as you get older, get more and more problems. And the more intense the teenage years were, and the 20s especially doing sports, and the more you sat in desks for years, the more you sat on chairs, the worse people get. And so most people are completely stuffed in their body by the time already they're 20 or 30. 20 and then certainly by 30. Five to 15 hours a day in the chair will do it for most people. They get massive knee problems, hip problems, back problems, neck problems, as you know. And so, so you, yoga. yeah, so, and so you do, and you studying physiotherapy, you saw this and you started to, you could see that there's something that, that needed to be met. Yes. Yes. So what uh, my partner, my girlfriend at the time now, who's still my business partner, Bianca Matchless, who also did physiotherapy and she'd also studied with Iyengar with me. So she's an amazing person. And we run this company called Yoga Synergy together. And, uh, so we then realized that what we had to do was to create a system which was based on traditional yoga, but adapted for the modern Western body. And that's what we basically did. We, we adapted the postures in a way that reorganized the Ashtanga Vinyasa sequence, for example, to make it more appropriate. We added bits at the beginning, at the end, we ordered a couple of things. Um, like for example, we incorporated a bunch of nerve tensioning positions for the wrist and upper arm, which made it much easier then to, um, to put the palms on the floor for the first salute. We also, instead of doing salute A and B in the Ashtanga, we changed salute, salute B to a specific lunging salute, which many people would call a salute to the moon. And we put that before the salute A and used it as a way of opening up the hip flexors, which for most people were, you know, mm. really compressed and shortened and tense from being sitting on chairs for so long. And when they're tense, the lower back goes. So if you give the average person a typical salute, which Ashtanga Yoga starts with, they get wrist and shoulder problems, wrist problems from the push up, shoulder problems from the downward facing dog, and then lower back problems from the upward facing dog. So we have to take all of these things into account and modify the poses accordingly. 
and prepare for the poses. We do spinal movements before starting the sequence and that helps people minimize the back problems. We do neck releases after the headstand. We put the headstand in the middle of the practice rather than at the end. And we right. prepared for it appropriately with you know poses before and poses after. And after the shoulder stand at the end, we would finish with poses to release the neck from shoulder stand. Because the releases of Iyengar and Patabi Joyce were not sufficient to release most of our students' necks. And I realized it firsthand because I had broken my neck when I was 21. So I needed to find things to fix up my broken neck. And along the way, I had a major injury in my lower back and had to find ways of fixing up my lower back. Mm. One of the uh, culminating things in my lower back that I remembered, I think it happened about 1993 when I'd just become physiotherapy was the back got really badly damaged. It was probably the only yoga-based injury I ever had. And it was going from doing, it was with a practice with Shando actually, and he, didn't, he wasn't teaching me, I was just following him. So I can't blame him. But we were doing leg behind the head. No, first we were doing Viprita, Viprita Shalabhasana. So chin on the floor, and like a reverse plow where you bring yeah. your legs right over your head. And you know, you see in Iyengar's book, he does it, he touches the feet by the side of his face and then you straighten the legs like a reverse plow. And I was pretty much at the reverse plow level when my knees were pretty much straight and I'm fully on my chin and it was really intense, really intense. And, uh, and we came out of this. Shandra on the other hand was doing something not as bendy going backwards. He was bending much less but he could bend forward very, very easily. And he'd been doing that since he was a kid. So the next pose he went into was both legs behind the head, which for him was not a difficult transition from an easy back arch to a, what was him very easy, legs behind the head. Legs behind the head for me was one of my most difficult poses. Back bends were much easier. So I went from my most difficult back bend to my most difficult forward bend, which is a little bit like going from you know, driving a car at uh, 80 kilometers per hour in you know, third gear and then going straight into reverse. You blow the gearbox. And that's what I did with my back. I could feel a massive crack. And I thought at the time it felt funny, but next morning I was paralyzed. I couldn't move out of my bed, took three hours to crawl to the lounge room. And for about two years, I was severely injured. And what it took to actually fix it up was the realization that when I was teaching my classes, I had to start bending in a different way. And what I started doing was something quite different to what I thought I understood from the anger system. And that was where you hear perhaps in many modern yoga classes, many Ashtanga classes, or many uh, Iyengar classes, they talk about folding forward from the hips. It's a fairly common expression. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how you have to lengthen the front of the body in a forward bend which was not what they were doing in traditional yoga. In traditional yoga, when someone did a forward bend, their chin goes right in, their head goes to their knee, and Janu Shiasasan would bring the head onto the knee without, with a big gap between your chest and the thigh. So it's a flexion. And many Westerners, yeah, many, uh, it's just total spinal flexion. And many Westerners went, oh, that's just people being stiff, you know, flexible is stretch your hamstrings. But actually, they weren't interested in stretching the hamstrings. They were interested in bending the spine. So what I found around this time when I damaged my back severely was somewhere along the line, I tore a hamstring as well. And when I was trying to demonstrate these standing splits versions in my class, I couldn't do it on the leg that was torn the hamstring. So what I started doing was cheating. I would push my sitting bones toward my heels, prevent my hips from bending forward and only bend forward at my spine. So I'd still get my head onto my knee and to the naked eye, to the innocent beginner, it still looked pretty impressive. It still looked like I was doing a spanning splits. To me, I felt I was cheating. But after a few days and a few weeks, I noticed not only did it relieve my hamstring um, problem, it fixed my hamstring problem and fixed my back up. And I suddenly realized the importance of bending forward at the spine something which you can't give a person who's got stiff hamstrings unless you don't stretch their hamstrings. And so one of the things I do most of all in my teaching now is teach spinal flexion without stretching either the back of the buttocks or the back of the knee. And this position is what I'd consider Patabi Joyce and Ashtanga Yoga's most fundamental pose in that it's called, you know, Trini. It's Lolasan. It's the pose which you're supposed to do twice for every up dog, down dog, 
which is a purely spinal flexion and neck extension posture. Yeah, yeah. And yet when you do it, when you show people, when I, I often show people just standing, just bend forward like this, which looks like someone slumping in a chair, but it's not. It's very, very different. And that posture was something which I understood through my own injury, through um, also my own understanding of anatomy. And it went against so many of the um, uh, modern yoga ideas that I became very controversial, but I helped people as well. And it made people's backs a lot better and it makes a lot more sense than what many people are teaching. You know, it's, um, it's been... And that's just, through your own, that's through just your own evolution of understanding your own process, but also yes. through the physiotherapy work and just working with people over the years. It's, I was in a really rare position. There's probably other people in the world like me now, but at the time I didn't know anyone else who'd studied so much with Iyengar, Patabi, Joyce, Desika Chah, and also other types of yoga, and had education as a physiotherapist. And this is around the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, when the Australian physiotherapists started talking about people with back problems need to draw their navel in toward the spine to um, prevent back injury. Mm. And this was something that was, it's, it's talked about all the time, pull your navel to the spine, pull your navel to the spine, bend but your it's knees. misunderstood. Mm. It's, it's, it bend, what does that say again? Bend your knees. You know, when you're picking, when you're picking up like, a, you have to yes. pull in, bend your knees and lift up yes. like this, to protect Yes, you have to protect your back. But people started associating that instruction with the Mula Bandha and Uriyana Bandha that was being talked about with, with Ashtanga Yoga. And it was completely confusing the issue. And it confused it so much so that Desika Chah even put this research from the Australian physiotherapist into his book, uh, The Heart of Yoga. But the research was subsequently proved to be um, inappropriately uh, applied. And so what the Australian physiotherapist did in the late 1980s was they did this series of tests that showed that someone with a bad back would have a different firing sequence of their muscles to someone with a good back. And so the idea was, they said, someone with a good back, someone who had no back pain, would have three events take place when they picked up a heavy object. First event is they would think, I want to pick up heavy object. Second event would be their hand would reach out to grab the heavy object. Third event would be their lower abdominal muscles would engage. Mm. That was the correct firing sequence for a healthy person's back. And what they observed was a person with a bad back, someone who had back pain, would have the same three events in a slightly different order. First event would be, I think I want to pick up heavy object. Second event would, uh, would be, um, sorry, I said it the wrong way. It, the people with the healthy back would have first event, brain thinks. Second event, lower abdomen engages. Third event is hand moves to pick up yeah. object. Whereas the person with the bad back would go the other way around. They would go first event, think of pick up heavy object. Second event, reach to grab it. Third event, their lower abdomen responds with a tensing after the hand moves. And it wasn't to do with a person with a bad back having a weak abdomen. It was to do with the abdomen not switching off and it's not switching on at the right time. And the muscles they were specifically talking about were the lower transverse abdominis, the multifidus and the perineum. And now somewhere along the line that got transferred to if you want to help a person to fix up their lower back, you need to get them to pull their, their lower abdomen in toward the spine, which later became pull their navel to the spine, which later became just Mula Bandha and Uriyana yeah. Bandha. Because they, they realized that, that the, um, the lower transverse abdominis would also trigger an activation of the center of the pelvic floor, which is the perineum, not the anus. Not the, genit not the urethra, but somewhere along the line then in the confusion with Patabi Joyce's bad English started talking about Mula Bandha, tight anus. And of course, Mula Bandha is not the anus. It's, uh, yeah. Anus is Ashvita Mudra. And so you do not want to tighten the anus when you're picking up heavy objects. Otherwise, you inhibit your diaphragm, causes stress response, lock your spine, all sorts of problems come with that. But this anal tightening and the drawing the navel to the spine was misunderstood because the anal tightening should have just been perineum only, and the navel to spine should only be lower transverse abdominis, not upper transverse abdominis. But what people started using was the oblique muscles to draw the navel to the spine, and the oblique muscles inhibit the diaphragm. The oblique muscles lock the spine. 
the oblique muscles, when they're activated, will cause more back pain, more weakness. But when you ask the average person to pull the navel to the spine, nine out of ten, well, two out of three will actually do it the wrong way. They'll pull the navel to the spine in a way which causes more stress, more discomfort, and more back pain. And the Australian physiotherapists realized this in about the year 2000, and they stopped teaching it. And they started to teach more intelligent things. But unfortunately, in that 10-year period, it went along to Jessica Char's book. Yeah. It went along to the Pilates world. It went along to, from the Pilates world to yoga world. And now everyone's confusing. So the horse is bolted, up. yeah. <laughs> the horse is bolted. It's now, Uddiyana means pull the navel of the spine. And uh, Mula Bandha means tighten your anus for many people. And that just causes stress and spinal dysfunction, internal organ disruption. And it took away the whole peace and love out of yoga and make it a, made it a stressful exercise, which just destroys your youth and vitality and causes problems mm. if people do those things. And along with that came the over-breathing. And Iyengar confused people with the chest breathing as well. So he was talking about chest breathing. But the chest breathing should only be done subject to initiating each breath diaphragmatically and in the pelvic floor. And many of his teachers just say, no, he was just saying breathe in the chest. And there's no way. He had a big expanded abdomen. Mm. He, he wasn't sucking his navel to the spine. He was showing you how to breathe diaphragmatically first and take that breath into the chest. But nine out of 10 people cannot do that. If you say to, not, if you say to people, breathe into your chest, as soon as they breathe in the chest, they're doing it by inhibiting their diaphragm. And you know, anyone listening to this could try this. And maybe a simple exercise, you and me could try it too. Sure. Is if you take a breath into your abdomen, breathe into your abdomen until your abdomen expands, expands and swells, right? And notice that's quite a relaxing feeling. It's what you do when you're relaxed. And if you do it even more relaxed, open the pelvic floor, breathe into the pelvic floor and the abdomen. And it's that relaxing feeling that you would do in a shavasana while you're asleep, letting your belly hang out, right? Yeah. Now, breathe into the chest. Take a deep breath into the chest. And almost everyone in the class has been told to do that, and the chest expands easily. Then you say to yourself, how are you breathing in the chest? So now, can you breathe into the abdomen when your abdomen is tense? So what I want you to do is I want you to exhale into your abdomen. So tighten the pelvic floor, exhale, and pull your navel right into the spine. Now keep the abdomen tight and in. Keep the abdomen tight and in. Right. Now yeah. breathe into your abdomen. And when you try and breathe into your abdomen like that, it probably doesn't feel easy to do. Probably feels right. stressful. Probably it felt like you're breathing into your chest a bit more. Yeah. Okay? So now, that's, that's a stressful feeling. Like you don't want that feeling if you're doing yoga because it blocks your spine and it causes stress. So now, Breathe into your chest, take a breath into your chest. And everyone does that. You ask, how are you actually doing this? Well, you're an experienced practitioner. So you're to an extent are ah, breathing in the chest. But most people will find the only way they are doing that is by inhibiting the diaphragm. So now try again to breathe in the chest, but before you do it, do the relaxing thing. Open the pelvic floor, expand the pelvic floor, like about to go to the toilet, but not. Then open the abdomen, expand and breathe into the abdomen. Keep your pelvic floor open, your abdomen expanded. Now with that expansion, try and also breathe in the chest. And notice the chest is not quite as easy to breathe into. No. You can do a lot better than most people because you're experienced. But now compare, tighten your pelvic floor, pull the navel to the spine, and right. then breathe into the chest. And it's much, much easier for almost everyone, including me. Sure, yeah. But for nine out of 10 people, Scott, they cannot breathe into the chest at all if you say open the pelvic floor and relax your abdomen. Indicating right, yeah. that nine out of 10 people are only breathing in the chest by doing the very thing that two minutes ago we showed made us feel stressed. And that's <laughs> most people's yoga. Right. Most people's yoga, and it will cause a turning off of your. Uh, parasympathetic nervous system it will switch on a sympathetic nervous system which is basically putting your internal organs into flight fight freeze or fear it turns off your digestive system immune system reproductive system and this will kill longevity this will wow, kill right. even health and happiness and unfortunately that's most people's yoga today and some people are not doing it but i think the people who are not doing this are the ones who survived yoga who actually did okay in the first year they're not the nine out of 10 people who give up yoga because it was too difficult or felt uncomfortable. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, the ones who teach, and they teach the same thing they practiced. Yeah, true. And so you kind of like, so you you spent like after this this period of time from uh, from 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 your physiotherapy study, and then going all the way from since then have just been unpacking this over and over and over. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I had another big unpack uh, as well. Like from ninety three, I began physiotherapy officially registered as a physiotherapist in 96 and then uh, kept going along another 10 years pretty much by myself for about 10 years. Shonda was a little bit around at the time and Ayanga was a, you know, a couple of times there, Patabi Joyce as well, but mostly by myself. And then I got to about 2004, 2005 and I met up with, um, what's his name? I wanted to learn some martial arts. So I met up with William Chung, who was a Chinese man who was the junior student when Bruce Lee was the, sorry, he was the senior student when Bruce Lee was the junior student of Yip Man. So right. he was quite a, you know, high up there dude. And I tried to learn a little bit from him. It was interesting learning with a Chinese person and a uh, different type of learning from the Indian teachers, but same in many ways, you know, the traditional teaching hardcore method. And then about a year or so later, I met, I was approached by a man called Zhen Hua Yang who I still see to this day. And uh, in the last 15 years, he taught me, well, we had an exchange. He asked me to teach him yoga. And so when I saw him, he looked pretty special. And I said, uh, you look like you do something already. And he got very excited, reached out and grabbed my arm with his hand. And then with the other hand, brought his hand close. And he said, I teach energy. And as he brought his second hand close to me, it felt like uh, being in Star Wars where the force just came right on my hands. And I wow. felt like a magnet came out of his hands. And he's very, very powerful. He can also do that trick like my Indian yoga teacher did of breaking metal bars with his throat. He can break rocks with his fingers. And he's been teaching me for the last 15 years and making me really appreciate where the Indian yoga, which has value, has been completely convoluted by the West. And you know, right. most of the yoga that we got in the West was a very watered down version. And that's why I was confused because the real Indian yogis can sit naked in the snow. They can stop their heartbeat. They can control their unconscious. But Iyengar and Patabi Joyce were not these people. They were mm. teaching basic stuff. Krishnamacharya might've known a little bit more. They all had their secrets, but can you pass these secrets? onto typical Western people, bodies with Western minds, Western ethics, no idea of what yama and yama is for themselves, let alone for others, you know? Mm. And that's, I think, where we went wrong, you know? So it sounded like when you went, when you went, when you went, um, Zhen Hua Yang, it was like another teacher, another, another person going, yes. and another like, yes. oh, this is the real yoga, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, really. Because, I mean, he knows his family, is uh, like his grandfather is still alive today and he's 113 or 115 or something like this. And he can still do very, very powerful things and still rides his bicycle. And, you know, I love Ayanga and Patabi Joyce and Krishnamacharya, but they only lasted to 100. Mm. Not that maybe age is the big deciding thing, but if someone is already 13, 14 years older and is still doing very well, maybe he knows something, you know? Mm. So he taught my teacher, and uh, also he was the last in the lineage of the bodyguards of the emperor of China. And my teacher went to the Shaolin temple, but, but his teacher, his grandfather was way above in, in rank, right. the head of the, of the Shaolin temple. So they had, they've got secret knowledge that is just beyond most people. And he's a one in a billion. He's an amazing guy. In fact, my, uh, the mother of my children is studying with him these last few days. Amazing. And I'll probably see him, I see him a few times a year still. He's amazing. And so it sounds like you, you know, it sounds like at the moment you find another, another teacher who you're kind of, who you're going down a rabbit hole with. Yes. But I'm, you know, they, there's gaps of a few years along the way. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. But I really love this idea that you still, but you're still, there's this evolution, even after what we're talking now, 40 years, you know, 45 years, there's still this evolution of learning and discovering yeah. and, and, and saying, oh, no, this is the real yoga. Yes. Well, my father taught me to hold my breath 54 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 
but I, I feel like in this life, it's not really going to be my place to become a super physical yogi. You know, I'm not sure if I'm going to, I mean, you never know. I've got, you know, maybe many more decades to go. So I'm, I'm not writing it off, but you know, there are many people who are physically much more adept at my age than I am. But I think what I may be good at is taking all the things that happened in my life, all the things I learned, all the mistakes I made, and then the improvements I've made in my later years and trying to pass them on. And so I think mm. I'm doing a much better job on my students than I did on myself. There's a really beautiful quote, which I, which I saw, uh, which, which, you, which is attributed to you, um, which is, yoga is when you make every cell of the body sing the song of the soul. I'd and I read to that. that myself, but I actually, I actually was in a group of people, about 20 people, when Miss Jayenga said that to us. Right. So that's from Miss Jayenga. That's a beautiful quote. When every cell of the body sings the song of the soul. What do you I'll think? You I mean, what do, what do you think that the soul that is being sung? For me, the purpose of yoga is to recognize that our individual consciousness is one with some universal consciousness and that we're all connected as one and that uh, the same way they say in modern physics that essentially all of creation is a manifestation of consciousness and this consciousness is totally connected. So all we have to do to get yoga is to recognize this, to realize that we're all connected. That's the ultimate purpose of yoga. But we're not going to re recognize that we're connected to each other as one big family or connected to the earth or connected to other realities until we first get physically connected within ourselves. So I think although the global aim of yoga is to realize there's a global connection or you know, world connection, universal connection, the individual aim of yoga is to become connected within yourself. And connection is something which will happen to me with an understanding of yama and niyama. Because if you're trying to communicate to any idea to someone else, you can't shout at them. If you start shouting at someone, if you're angry at someone, they basically don't listen to you. The only way you can have any sort of communication is it's got to be loving communication. And when communication is loving and you share good energy between people, when there's an exchange of good energy and loving information, that's when ideas can be transmitted. So if we want to achieve the global aim of yoga, the universal aim of recognition that we're all connected as one and finally get to that place where John Lennon was talking about a place where there's no borders, no countries, no religions. It has to first happen within ourselves. And so what we've got inside ourselves is 50 trillion cells, each of them with their own individual consciousness. And I'm lucky that as a molecular biologist, I saw individual cells from organisms when you break them down into tissue culture. When you put them into a dish and they separate, they all act like they have a mind of their own. But when you bring the cells together, they start acting like a colonial group consciousness. So like a swarm of bees or a swarm of birds all act and think together. Our body is a swarm of 50 trillion individual consciousnesses, which has come together as a community that acts as one. And we call that one us, me, you, our individual self. But actually we are not one consciousness. We are collective unity, uh, a, a teamwork of 50 trillion. But perfect health is when that really is happening. And ill health is when you've got disassociation, where you've got some cells deciding they don't like other cells, so they're going to kill them. And it's called autoimmune disease. Or when some cells become really greedy and they want to hog all the energy, and it's called a cancer. And many other things like this. And so what we want for perfect health is to share good energy and loving information inside our body. And we want basically every cell to treat every other cell in that harmonious way that we'd like the world to treat each other. Uh, and that the best way of epitomizing that I think is to think of like, recognize that we're all connected as one family. And you and me are connected. We know we're 15 cousins, second aunts, daughters, grandson. I mean, you're like this sort of, but you can't appreciate that. But you can appreciate that the mother of your children is totally connected like the mother of my children is totally connected with her children because one time the children grew inside her. 
they were part of her. And so a mother is this goddess on the earth who recognizes that the thing that came out of them was once part of them. And they'll always have it. Even and my mother still treats me like I'm five because she, you know, bless her. So this feeling of the mother and the young baby, that to me epitomizes what yoga should be. Because the young mother, when the baby comes out, will share good energy and loving information. Sometimes it's tougher. Sometimes it's torturous to see them breastfeeding for two years, sucking away at a nipple painfully, but they're doing it with passion. Ayenga said that tapas is passion, loving something while still doing it arduously. Mist mistakes to the passion of now today, of the uh, tapas of today. But what we want then is every cell of our body to treat every other cell like a mother treats a young baby, to treat them by sharing good energy and loving information inside the body. And for me then, on a physiological level, good energy means good blood flow, circulation flowing through your body, but not with the heart racing, which indicates a flight or fight response, but with blood flow like the yogi in the snow. Sitting naked in the snow, heart's not racing, but the blood flows. Good circulation. And loving information is the information that dominates through the nervous system, including the neurotransmitters, hormones, immunotransmitters of the body that dominate when you're in a parasympathetic dominant mode, when the state of rest rejuvenation, relaxation, and regeneration dominates over the state of flight, fight, freeze, or fear. Because what's yoga meant to be like? If your heart races, if you breathe too much, if you feel stretch or tension in the body, this is not yoga. This is a state of flight or fight. The stretch reflex is part of your flight or fight response. You should not feel a stretch if you're in yoga. Imagine if you crossed your arms and you went, that's a good elbow stretch. You'd think something was wrong with your elbow. Whenever we feel a stretch, that's something wrong. Whenever, imagine bending your elbow and going, that's a good biceps workout. No, you move your body, it should feel effortless. And when mm. you feel effortless, that's the armor that comes right after stira sukham asana. Be mm. firm, but calm. Do it till it's effortless. Do it for three hours. Then you approach the duality within. Then you're ready for pranayama. This sort of stuff, you know, like this. And yeah. so my aim and my practice is I do three things. One is to get people to appreciate the purpose of their practice, to circulate good energy and loving information inside their body by enhancing blood flow in a parasympathetically dominant state while treating their body in a way which doesn't stuff their body up and helps create strength and flexibility without feeling tense or, st or stretchy. And once they get that in their body, they can be a good model for how they work in the world. And to do this, I do two more things. One is I stop blocking good energy and loving information by tensing less, stretching less, breathing less, thinking less. And then the other thing is I move the good energy and information by moving actively, moving from the core instead of locking the core, beginning my breath also always with natural breathing before mm -hmm. I think about breathing in the chest and moving fluidly because energy travels in curves, not in straight lines, not mm -hmm. in zigzags. And these are the basis of my practice. And with that, then I can transmit yama and niyama in action. And it results in healthy physical body, joints, muscles, and bones, healthy physiological body, meaning good blood flow, nervous system, internal organ system, and a healthy mind because it puts you into a meditative state. Where the meditative state is not just no mind, it's also a place like the Tibetan yogi has when they're sitting naked in the snow and they're still warm. Because meditation without warmth is not meditation. It's just sitting in an uncomfortable position in a cold room, getting cold and numb. That's what most people do. They call it meditation, but it's getting numb, cold, and bored while doing a numb, boring, cold activity. Real meditation is doing a boring activity and being excited, doing something which is really uh, cold and still being warm. It's the resolution of opposites we call ha and ta in Hatha Yoga. Amazing. And so thinking about like that six year old <laughs> who, <Yeah>. first, <laughs> who first who first learned kumbakas and stuff like that, and then the eight year old who learned Nauli, to looking at and being the you know, and thinking about oh no, this meditation is it's being able to this yoga is about sitting in the cold and being finding heat and meditating and and knowing and, and where you are right now what have you learned 
Where are you? Oh, it's all about love, isn't it? I mean, it's what we always knew. It's all about love. It's about, you know, you can choose happiness at any moment of your life, but it's easiest to choose happiness if you're in love. And what we want is to share loving information. But when you're sharing loving information, when you give love to people, it's actually a better feeling than uh, receiving love. Because everyone strives to get love. They want to get, but people don't really want to be loved. Because you know when that ugly kid at school sends you love letters, and you go, that revolting person sent me a love letter. Ugh. She, you know, he or she really loves me. No one cares. But sometimes you're that revolting kid at school who sends someone else the love letters. And you're just totally passionate about this person who could not give a stuff about you. But when the feeling of giving love is had inside you, you feel something. Receiving love gives you nothing. So what we should practice is give love. And the best person to practice it on, because not everyone likes, you can't just walk up to a bus driver and embrace them and give them love. They'll kick you. So the only person you're safe to give love to is yourself. So spend some time, give love to yourself. You're a person who's an allowable subject. You have permission. And what starts to happen is you start to look like a person who starts to like, who looks like someone who might like receiving love. And then everyone approaches you because people like to give love, but they don't want to give it to someone who doesn't look like they like receiving love. So if everyone starts practicing giving love to themselves, you get the practice of giving love, it makes it much easier to give to other people. You start to look like someone who likes to receive love so people can practice on you and the world would be a better place. Beautiful. I suppose, <laughs> I mean, I suppose that, that obviously might tie in with my last question, which I always like, like to leave people with. This has been an epic conversation. Thank you, Simon. But the last question I, I, I like to leave is, um, is to ask you what do you feel it means what do you feel it what do you feel it means to live a contemplative life a contemplative life wow you know what i do before i go to bed every night i mean I actually lie in bed and as i lie in bed i you know one of my japanese teachers told me something he said to me be here now and he wrote it in Japanese in my book and I engraved it on my shirt. And to me, it was about meditation. He was a Zen meditative master. Be here now. And so often I'll say to my students at the end of the class, be here and now, be still, calm and quiet in, the, in body, breath and, and mind in the present moment. But actually what I do before I go to sleep and often throughout the day at different times is I go from my first year of my life to my 60th year of my life, because it's my 60th year of my life. And I even go to the months before I was born. And for every year of my life, I think about the important people and the important events that happened. And I contemplate them. And I contemplate the good, the bad, and the ugly while we're there. And I think about them all. And especially I dwell on the good because it's the nicest thing to dwell on. But also the bad teaches you stuff as well. And so then, I believe that really to embrace the universal consciousness, you can't just live in the present moment. It's not functional. So for us to be whole people, we can't just be living here and now. We have to act with each other based on our experiences from the past. We project into our future via experiences from the past. And really living in the here and now is an expression that doesn't really work. You have to live in all time. And so what I do before I go to bed is I go through every year of my life, if I can sometimes in months, every person, every interaction, and I remember as much as I can. And I, I collect things in my life to remember. And I, I, I love it when something triggers a memory inside me. I think our memories really are the gathering of our consciousness. Beautiful. Thank you, Simon. That was awesome. Oh, such a pleasure to talk with you and, you know, not everyone is a good person to talk to. And some interviewers are really bad. You are a master of what you do. So thank you for having this time with <laughs> it's me. It's been my absolute pleasure. Simon, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Mm.